Hello and welcome to another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. I'm Dino Verley, founder and CEO of Project Purple and host of the Project Purple Podcast. We have another interview for you coming up with a very special guest after a few quick updates. The Project Purple Podcast has surpassed over 100,000 plays. So thank you to all our guests for allowing us to share their journeys and to all our listeners out there for listening. We've already got through the January of 2024 and 2023 was our best year ever. We set another record. So I just want to thank everyone who has supported, donated, or participated in our Project Purple event in 2023. Um, We hope that the trend continues as the last two years have been our best two years, year after year. Uh, So 2024 has launched and many of our 2024 teams are out and available. We are actually back in the Boston Marathon as an official charity partner for the first time since 2018. This now makes us an official charity partner of the five largest world marathons. And many of our other 2024 races will be launching very soon, including the coveted New York City Marathon, which is always a popular one. We also have our virtual event series, Purple Patties, which is the first in our virtual event series, has launched. That happens in March over St. Patrick's Day weekend. So if you're interested in getting involved with that, we'd love to have you get your friends and family together and run, walk, enjoy Purple Patties in March. For those local here in Connecticut, we're excited to announce our second annual charity pickleball classic happening on February 24th in Oxford, Connecticut, along with our fourth annual golf charity classic happening at Shorehaven Country Club on June 3rd, Monday, June 3rd in Norwalk, Connecticut. To learn more about all these great events, visit our website at projectpurple.org and make sure to follow us on social media to stay up to date on all things Project Purple. Without further ado, let's meet our special guest today coming to us from New Jersey, not that far, but far enough, author Megan Murphy. Megan, welcome to the Project Purple podcast. Yay. Thank you for having me. Well, as I said before we hit record, I, I did a little bit of homework. I don't usually do homework as my as my guests know, but I did some homework. You've been involved in, in print and in TV and in media for a long, long time. Very successful career. Super excited to have you on uh, to talk about kind of your experience, your journey with pancreatic cancer. So um, as is customary on our podcast, the first segment is always our guest opportunity to kind of share a little bit about themselves. I'm sure people may know a little bit about you, uh, just given your background, um, some of the shows you've been on. I know you're a regular on, on some of the shows that you probably go into as well. Um, so the name is probably familiar, but talk a little bit about what you've been doing and, and also about your experience with pancreatic cancer. So with that, as I say, the microphone is yours to kind of share that journey. Yeah, I think sometimes people recognize my scratchy voice if they don't recognize my name. Um, I'm a longtime media personality. Uh, My magazine career started when I was 18 years old at YM Magazine. I was one of the founding editors of Teen People Magazine, spent some time at Cosmopolitan, uh, a long time at Self Magazine at Condé Nast. Then I was a senior editor at Cosmopolitan Magazine before heading to Good Housekeeping for seven years, and I am currently the editor-in-chief of Woman's Day magazine. I'm also an author. Um, I wrote Your Fully Charged Life, which is a radically simple approach to having endless energy and filling every day with yay. It came out with Penguin Random House um, in 2021. Paperback came out in 2022, and it's now in four languages. I do talk about my, my father's battle with pancreatic cancer in my book, um, and all of the gifts that were part of that awful journey. And um, I'm also a regular on the Today Show, uh, a frequent flyer on Live with Kelly and Ryan, a lifestyle expert. My degree is from Mason Gross at Rutgers in theater, and I was uh, an MTV host in the 90s and have, you know, commercials off Broadway, the whole nine. And I would always like to say my most important job is to to my th- as mom to three kids. I have a 13, uh, 11, and 10 year old, and a labradoodle. I'm also I'm also a fur mama. Love it. I love it. So let's go all the way back to the beginning. Why? How did you get into this career? Like, what was kind of like the inspiration? Sure. You know, 
Was it someone in college, a family member possibly? No. Um, I made my mess my message. So I was a teenager who um, struggled um, pretty deeply. I write, I also write about that in your fully charged life, but um, I um, struggled with depression and an eating disorder. Uh, I lost my best friend who passed away. I had three or four hospitalizations from my eating disorder and really kind of hit rock bottom. And through a lot of therapy and work, I began to inch out of it and I recovered from my eating disorder and I wrote an essay about that journey and those challenges. And that essay won me a big fat scholarship. I got a $10,000 scholarship. I became a Horatio Alger National Scholar. I was featured on a NBC special and that was sort of the springboard of my career. By making my mess my message, by being vulnerable, by sharing that journey, it opened me up to this world of possibility and connection and is truly the reason I, I wound up having this pretty cool magazine career. This is, uh, so I have a term, I, I say loaded questions. So sure. this is my first loaded question. And let me preface this by saying, with my loaded questions, there's never a right or wrong sure. to that. Hindsight being 2020, have you ever looked back at that struggle um, that you had um, with the eating disorder and, and and ever thought like, hey, like if I didn't go through that, would I be in the position that I'm in today? Or that those challenges, maybe it wasn't just the yeah. eating disorder, but the challenges that you experienced. Yeah. I mean, I think that's why I always say there's, there's a lot of gifts and adversity um, when you're willing to unwrap them. And I think later in life, when my father was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer, that journey led me to become an author. So for me, through any adversity, I build resilience and those resilience tools have, have sort of set me up for success because I do feel unflappable now at 48 years old from the different challenges I've had to go through. Um, but I, but I mean, I've really learned to like flex my resilience muscles. I have endless resilience. I feel completely unflappable in the face of anything, which has allowed me to have success. So that's a that's a particular mindset, though. Do you think? Like yeah, having a hundred percent. I and I say this all the time. The same way I trained to run the New York Marathon, I trained to live with grit and grace. So I have a fully charged toolkit. That's what I write about in your fully charged life. And when my dad was dying from pancreatic cancer, I had three small children. I was having a hard time getting out of bed in the morning. I had a big job at a magazine and I made a promise to him one day in chemo that I wouldn't be negative, that I would, I would live with grit and grace. I would figure out how to do that. And I would share those tools. And so I sort of made this pact with my dad that um, I've done hard things before. I know how to do hard things and I'm going to share that toolkit and I'm going to write about it. And I, I promised him in chemo, I'm going to write this book. I'm going to share this toolkit and I'm going to do this hard thing too. If you look back at part of the challenge, maybe as a, as a child going through elementary school, were there situations or times where you could maybe not fully see that, but were there like incidents where maybe a little bit of that showed up the grit and, you know, having somewhat of that mindset that you just talked about early on in your life? No, I, so I would say this, I would, so I would say two things. I had very big emotions. I'm an empath. And as a kid, I didn't know what to do with those emotions, right? Because as a kid, it's like, don't cry. Why are you so mad? Why are you so upset? Why is that so funny, right? Like my emotions were always really big and ginormous and I didn't really know how to manage them. And mm -hmm. I learned, I became anorexic because I was trying to quiet some of that chaos. I didn't have other resources to manage those emotions. I didn't know where to put those big feelings. So a piece of the journey was learning how to manage big emotions and understanding how to channel that energy differently. Um, movement became a big piece of that for me. So like as a kid, I was a pretty damn good athlete because I was aggressive and tenacious and unstoppable. 
even on the soccer field, I didn't always have the best footwork, but you couldn't catch me. And I was going to shut you down because I was tenacious. So it was, you know, kind of a combination of those things. Yeah, I I, I bring that up. And, and this is why, because I, I'm always curious. And, and so a lot of times we get survivors on and they go through trauma early in life or they go through these experiences that at the time don't realize like, hey, when they're then dealing with pancreatic cancer, they went through all these things to prepare them, mm -hmm. right? And, and I'm not saying I have the answers here at all, Megan, but sometimes as the as the guest, you, you, you're like, we're drawing a picture, right? And we're meeting for the first time yeah. and talking about sure. like what experiences or how people get, like the mind is such a, it's a powerful organ or, or the brain, right? Like, and, and the mind itself is just so powerful. And I'm always like super like engaged and super like intrigued on like, why do people like what, what's the switch or why did people turn that mindset? And I believe we're all capable of doing that, but we don't know how to. Yeah. It, that makes but sense. I think it's also thinking about like, if resilience is a muscle that gets trained, right? So you yeah. do one hard thing, you get stronger, you get braver, Correct. you get more capable and you go through the second hard thing and you get stronger and you get braver and you get more capable and you get more grit. And like, so it's, it's like training and it, and like, so all of those hard things help you prepare for the next hard thing. Yeah. But I would love for humanity if we could fast forward all that, right? But yeah. you got to put the work in, right? But it's almost like I, we've always probably, or maybe you have, I've seen stories where, you know, like the, the um, I remember reading the story about a child who got pinned under a car and then the mom comes over and is able to lift the, yeah. yeah, lift the car up, right? And say, or, you know, the child falls in the pool and someone who doesn't know how to swim just jumps into the pool and yeah. saves the child, right? In a body of water. And so you hear these like things. And so I'm always super fascinated by like the brain and the mind and that mindset. And I, I truly do believe like we're all capable of doing amazing things, but it's just fascinating to see like what's what's the trigger or what's the 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 path that people are on to get to that point where they're able to realize that they can do these things and grind through that, right? Like grind through the shit of cancer. Um, and in particular, in this case, pancreatic cancer mm -hmm. to get to that point where they can beat this thing or they are at peace with this thing. Um, so it's just really kind of fascinating and, and clearly with your experience and, and what you've done and, and the the the, uh, the experiences you had in your life, I, I thought that just would be kind of a cool way to kind of understand it and hear a little bit about it. I want to shift gears here to your dad. So let's talk a little bit about your dad and his experience. I had just turned 40. I had a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a two-year-old. And wow. I was the executive editor of Good Housekeeping. And it, you know, it was really crazy because you know, my dad was 66 years old, yeah. 11 grandkids, um, and otherwise healthy. Like we had, like it was like a shock. It was an absolute shock. It was like, oh, my back hurts. I think it was from throwing the kids around in the pool. Like I shouldn't have been throwing like, oh, they're getting big. I shouldn't be tossing them in the air. Had an MRI. Something's wrong with his back because he had, was otherwise completely healthy. And I would say like, not like Jack LaLanne healthy, going to the gym every day and like, you know, but like a relatively healthy guy, like not overweight, like golfed, moved, but like, you know, not the way I exercise every day, <laughs> all those things, but like a relatively healthy guy. And the, the, the process of having him diagnosed and go through was, was just surreal. And my mom had been through breast cancer and we had had a lot of cancer in the family. So like we, we've heard, we had heard the big C before, but yeah. this was different, man. This was hard. I mean, I can, and my brother and sister and my mom and I, and we were all, it, we went to all the doctor's appointments. We were there with the diagnosis, like stage four, holy crap. I got him to John Hopkins. Like we tried 
everything and anything and went through some really scary stuff where, you know, he had had the stint and then went into septic shock and we almost lost him in Baltimore, got him home. And, you know, he was diagnosed in August and gone January. Uh-huh. Yeah, I I hate pancreatic cancer. Um, you know, we've dealt with quite a bit of cancer. I, I you know, I just had a, a year ago, I had a preventative double mastectomy with reconstruction because I have the genetic mutation and I'm like F cancer. Like well, I was just going to ask that yeah. with you were saying like your mom and your dad, I mean, and, and lots yeah. of cancers, there's probably, so were you BRCA positive? I have a check two mutation. Oh yeah. Okay. So I had had, which also I have some, I watch my thyroid. I watch my yep. colon. Um, and we, we just, my mom had breast cancer twice. All the women on my mom's side have had breast cancer. Uh, we've got some other cancers that I not a liberty to divulge, but we've had, yeah a lot of cancer in the family. Um, and my husband lost his dad to kidney cancer. His mom's had breast cancer. So like we're we've just been a lot of cancer. So genetics back eight years ago, wasn't a thing, right? Like, and, no. and now, and, and no, it's so startling and so crazy. So two years ago, the NIH uh, you know, National Institute of Health, which sets protocol for cancer and screening and everything, put out this big bulletin that every pancreatic cancer patient in the United States, when upon diagnosis, needs to get genetic testing because we do know that up to 10% of the cases here in the United States come from some sort of genetic mutation. Yeah. That's a good thing uh, because there is a, a treatment protocol that does fairly well um, and for some patients does really well. Um, and so knowing that information could be life-saving and life-altering in a positive way. And I have to tell you this, Dino, so like having gone through my mom with breast cancer and my dad with pancreatic cancer, I had a lump, it was benign, Mm -hmm. but it was, I I had very dense breasts. And when I, I knew my genetic information for two years before I even took action, because I said to my breast surgeon, I'm like, it's not pancreatic cancer. I'll beat it. Like, this is ridiculous. Like, why? Like, it took me a while to come to terms with even breast cancer being something that I should be afraid of and should take action to prevent because I was so scarred from pancreatic Yeah. But all cancers, every cancer, right? Even colon cancer, right? Colon cancer, yeah. like that's the thing, like everyone for years was like, ah, I don't want that tube up my butt, right? Like, ah, I'm not doing that. I'm not, And I don't even think it was the tube. I think it's the pre, right? Like people yeah, don't want to drink like, mm. the, the barium or whatever that thing is. Um, because you're on, you're, yeah, you're on the toilet, not the gig, well, whatever. Uh, we had a friend deal. who was 37 who died of colon cancer with a two week old baby and a two year old. So like, yeah, it's awful, awful. So it, it, it's so crazy though. Genetics, then a report just came out like a month ago that only 32% of the patients in pancreatic cancer were given genetic testing. So we're still failing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like it's so crazy. Um, you know, again, eight years ago, there wasn't any genetics. Would it have made it a difference? I mean, I guess we can say here, we could sit here and, and debate that all night. Um, but the one thing we do know, and, you know, with genetics, with certain markers here, there there is a higher risk. Um, so I know you mentioned a little bit going through that, like, process, but was there, like, PTSD in that, like, going through that, like, that double? Yeah. Like, I, I got to imagine that that could not have been easy because thinking in the back of your mind what you went through, not only with your mom, but then with your dad. Yeah. You know, it was, for me, it was a little bit of, like, guilt that I got to make this decision for my body before my body made it for me. I think there yeah. was a piece of me saying, like, like, I'm so lucky. Like, I get to do this. And in, in, in those moments when it was, like, recovery was hard and it was uncomfortable and difficult like it was difficult and I have to keep reminding myself like how lucky are you how lucky are you how lucky are you because I mean my dad was gone so quickly so quickly it's so it's scary because I feel like okay here we are eight years from your your journey uh with your dad and I don't know I mean, we, we, we've had people come through our organization for support and, and, and 
you know, I, people often ask, I got asked this question not too long ago. If we've made any advances since my experience 13 years ago, and now my my dad was alive three and a half years, but the last six months were awful. I, so I always kind of preface that, but that was still a lot longer than I know a lot of people get. Um, and unfortunately, we just lost a young gentleman um, who was sadly very young in his 30s. But, um, you know, from when we got involved to his passing was less than six months. Yeah. So I don't know, you know, Megan, and, and I get this question often is like, have we gotten any better? And I, I think for some we have, you know, there's a percentage out there with genetics and maybe for some other folks that are able to tolerate the medications that, that currently are available. But for a lot of people, we haven't. Um, and that's unfortunate. Um, but the awareness is key, like talking about these stories. Um, and, and I do think, you know, to go back to where I said before, like sharing these things, whether it's mindset, you talk about these gifts. And I want to talk about, want to shift here a little bit and talk about the book and about what these gifts are. Um, I think are beneficial in, in sharing. So let's talk about that because you mentioned, you know, the gifts, I'm putting air quotes here, the gifts of pancreatic cancer. And one of them was the inspiration for this book. So how did that come about? Where, where did that happen? You know, so, what was the situation? Um, as a young, like as a mom with these young kids and really struggling to kind of like function, I started something called Operation Good Grief. And it was a challenge to myself to find one thing that didn't suck every day and to document it and to share it on social media. So like on those really, really dark early days when I was just overwhelmed with grief, what's one thing that doesn't suck? Like very actively looking for one thing that didn't suck. And I would take a picture of that and I would post it on social media and I would use the hashtag Operation Good Grief. And that actually that that process of doing that over the course of a year two years really wound up cementing this very deep and profound sense of gratitude because what i was really doing was pausing to appreciate the good in life when it didn't seem like there was much of it um and it could be something like oh my gosh the daffodils are finally blooming at the end of my walk uh, I got to do this great workout with a bunch of girlfriends and I had this sense of community and it was a great way to start my Monday. Um, you know, like really kind of noticing the world around me, finding the awe in what was awesome and documenting it. And that sense of gratitude changed me and it allowed me to sort of move through my grief with more grace and to to see the good more easily as I moved on learning to live without my dad. Cause my dad was my guy, like my, like my, Oh yeah. Might make me choke up. If you look back another loaded question here was, can you find a time that you can look back and say, this was the moment for the book? Oh, crying a little. Sometimes I cry. I hate January because January is a death year. Mm. The anniversary of the death. I hate January. And it hasn't been sunny in a very long time. Um, yes, but so I, I joined, I was lucky enough to join my dad for chemo. And that is when I made the pact to him to, to do this book and to share the journey. And I had already, before he passed, I had already started Operation Good Grief because I was very much having a hard time functioning. Um, and, but I made him, I made a pact with him that I would continue to find the positive and share these strategies and continue to live differently because I had, I put him through hell with my tumultuous teen years. I mean, we're talking three or four hospitalizations. Like I was bad. I was a hot mess. Um, and I had pulled myself through that and I, I promised to pull myself through this. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I know that's not easy to do. But uh, I remember reading this. I think it was Joe, not to get political here, but I think it was Joe Biden's book. 
about his son. Um, and there was a comment uh, or a set, sentence in there about, um, you know, why we why we cry when, when we lose a loved one. And I'm probably butchering this. I, I probably have the book on my bookshelf here in my studio, but it was something along the lines that um, we cry for people when we talk about them because that's how much they mean to us. And you know what, Megan, um, it's just me as the host here to, to have that moment with you is pretty special because it just shows how important and impactful your dad was and the relationship that you had with your dad as I get choked up or also, as we like, talk about this. I really hate pancreatic cancer. Like, I love that you do this. Um, it's not a, it's not a career I, I sought to do after college, uh, but it's one I, uh, I, I, I love every day. I, there's never a day I I've woken, I've woken up, I should say, um, in the last 13 years where I go, I don't want to go to work today. Yeah. Uh, so I, I can say as a, as a professional, I, I, I've, in 13 years or 13 and a half years, I don't know how long it's, it's almost 14 years now. Uh, I've never had a day where I've woken up and said, I don't want to go to work today. Um, that's why, like I said, before we hit record, I was here yesterday on a Sunday. Uh, we record this on a Monday and um, it, not about me, but just hearing the story, I, I come in a lot on the weekends and it doesn't bother me, which is not a good thing for my family. Um but it's a good thing for me because I love what I do. Yeah. And not many people can say they they love what they do, right? Um, so I don't want to give away the entire book here because sure. part of this is we want people to go out and get the book. Um, so let's talk a little bit of a couple of reasons why people should do that. Sure, I think so. It's a happiness toolkit. And I would say that I'm a happiness hacker. And I really believe that none of us are broken and none of us need to be fixed. But I bet that that I can inspire you with one small micro action that could create some really awesome positive momentum in your life that could make you find more yay in every day. I'm about creating momentum, one teeny tiny little action step at a time. So then how, and again, not to give it away, how do we handle obstacles when we're trying the, to get those teeny tiny steps? Because there's going to be obstacles. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the key is, is build, building these energy reserves by taking lots of positive micro actions all the time. So I look at different buckets in your life. I look at your health charge and I give you strategies for protecting your sleep and for creating movement. I look at the positive charge. I help you get mindset shifts to live um, with more optimism. I look at the recharge. That's all about dealing with grief and hard things with grit and grace. Um, I have the um, love charge, which really focuses on relationships and the importance of not just the big pillar key relationships in our lives, but our relationships with what so-called weak ties, cashiers, baristas, and how those interactions have so much power to create sparks of energy and connection in our lives. Um, it's really, it's, it's kind of a toolkit. I don't even like to call it a roadmap. It's a toolkit that can help you live a little bit differently. Love it. I, I got a question for you. Sure. I got a lot of questions that just popped up. Okay. One is, do you... Do, <laughs> So I'm the guy when I go to New York City and I'm staying in the city and I run in Central Park that I, for the last, I, I can't remember when I started doing this, but it was probably early on. Um, I say good morning to everyone that I see in Central Park mm -hmm. because my parents are immigrants. A lot of people helped us along my parents' journey. Um, grew up in a Roman Catholic household. So, you know, faith was a big part of that. Love your neighbor, right? One of the tenets of, of Catholicism, you know, and respect and respect. I just think saying good morning to someone in the morning is what you should do. But most people don't, and most people avoid that. So I, I guess in, in, in that vein, 
how do we like, like there's, I, I feel like this, I just wrote this down. There's so, there's so much noise out there to do this. So do you think like, just by doing that, by saying good morning every day and to me, that's just common sense. I don't know. Maybe yeah. that's just me. I know a lot of people, even when I get on the train, I go to the train in New York City. Some You sit down the next one, you say hello or good morning or good afternoon. Yeah. I know people don't like to talk because they're in their zone or they have these headphones and yeah, everyone's and on I their phone. Like it, I mean, and some words can be unspoken, right? So sometimes I think it's as simple as like being off of your phone when you're, when you're checking out at the grocery store. Are you on your phone? Like, are you like got your AirPods on or are you registering someone else's humanity at the register? Cause that's really what it's about. It's like making eye contact, even a smile, understanding that we're all in this together. And it's sometimes just recognizing other people. And it doesn't have to be like a big hello, big giant conversation. I always say like, I don't need to braid your hair. We don't need to barbecue, but like, I'm going to make sure that I recognize that you're here too. And we share this planet and we're all in this together. We need each other. Right. It's absolutely true. The, the world would be a better, we would be in a better, a lot better place in a lot of things if people had that mindset. So we'd I'm also that- be less lonely and there's a loneliness sure. epidemic. And that is a piece of it. Like we need each other. Like it, the foundation of positive psychology talks so much about the fact that the biggest answer to all of our problems is each other. Like we need each other and and it doesn't have to be big. It can just be my phone's in my pocket. I'm using your name tag and I'm going to call you by name, right? In, in the grocery store or at the post office, I'm going to know my mail carrier's name. I'm going to know the recycling people's name and I'm going to use it and I'm going to interact and I'm going to treat one person the way I treat all people. This is another loaded question, but do you think like with the advances in technology, which could or could not be done systematically on purpose that we've already mentioned one, right? The phone, right? That there are certain things in this world that are determined to make us less social and to less less consciously aware of what we are doing and how we are acting. Yeah, I think it, I mean, I think so much of the technology is toxic, right? I mean, like, we do need to get sort of just back to basics, like back to basics, humanity kind of stuff. Not giving everything away here, but are there like a couple tips, like one or two things that people can start really small that could be like bigger picture, longer term strategies? I mean, it's simple things like get an alarm clock. Don't use your phone, right? Like that shouldn't be your lifeline next to the bed that's also waking you up, that's also like everything at once, right? Like something as small as like taking that away so it's not the first thing you're doing in the morning is checking social and text messages and whatnot, putting yourself like on a news diet so that you're not consuming all of that social content, like scrolling TikTok and whatever for more than X amount of minutes a day like challenging yourself to actually make a phone call and to hear somebody's voice versus sending an email, challenging yourself to write a letter instead of sending a happy birthday text, like sending a card, right? Like what are the ways that you can sort of put yourself on a tech diet and challenge yourself to interact in a more meaningful, alive kind of way? I love that term tech diet. I think that's it's the only you know, kind of diet I endorse, frankly. Well, yeah, because this is my only thing. Do diets, people tend to like when we wordsmith here, like diets come and go, right? So, like, well, like the key word in die it is die. Correct. So, like, maybe there's a piece of tech that does need to die the iPhone, and Apple's probably going to come after me after. Yeah. Um, you know, when you were saying that, I go, you know what, you're a hundred percent right. So I use my phone as my alarm. And I do know like I feel so much more energized when I don't check my email until after I've worked out, until I'm at the office or I'm I'm sitting in the parking lot of the office. As I mentioned, it's a 10-minute ride. 
So, um, but yeah, and, and now the excuse is like, well, my son's at college and I need the phone nearby me, God forbid, if something happens. But I mean, I guess like my wife puts it in the bathroom. So it's like completely out of her like reach, which is good. Uh, but yeah, I think I need to order an, uh, an alarm clock on Amazon as we end this podcast. I think that's going to be my to do here. Um, I've got two questions left here for you. Sure. Um, and then we're going to share with our audience where they can connect and learn more about your book and, and more about what you do. Um, do you have a mentor? Someone that you kind of look up to or someone who's kind of maybe not someone that you know personally, but someone that's mm-hmm. kind of like helped you kind of guide you through this whole process? Sure. So I talk a lot about um, resilience mentors in life and finding people who have done the thing you're struggling with. So when my dad was dying, I serendipitously met a woman at the gym whose dad had died of pancreatic cancer. I was crying on a treadmill. I write about it in my book. And she was like, oh, my dad passed X amount of years ago. And she became my grief mentor. And I knew that someday I'd be able to run on the treadmill without crying like she was. And so I love the idea of mentors being people who have endured the thing you're enduring to give you proof that you will someday come out the other side Mm. and you will breathe again. When I was having my double mastectomy, I had a, had a, a mentor who had been through the process a year sooner when I had an infection and I was struggling. I looked to her for my my receipts, my proof that a year from now, I would be okay. I would be cheering on the soccer sidelines and I would be okay. Um, and so to me, I don't have these big giant like Michelle Obama mentor moments. It's like, I look to normal people doing normal things and I'm tr- struggling like hell to do myself. Pretty powerful. I think a lot of times people feel like they need someone like uh, George Clooney or to your point, Michelle Obama or Oprah Winfrey to be their mentor. Listen, they're great, but that's, I'm like a very big believer in thinking smaller to move bigger. So powerful. My last question here, and this is the the loaded question of all loaded Mm -hmm. questions. There's no right or wrong to it. Your experience that you went through with your, your dad What's your definition of the term pancreatic cancer? How do you define it? Uh, I like feel sick. I like I have like a visceral. I I think it's the it's it's just pure. It's pure evil. I had a friend who lost her dad to pancreatic cancer last week, and it's it's just it's a death sentence. It's a it's a shit shit cancer. Powerful. Megan, the best place uh, for our audience to connect with you. I know you're active on social media to learn more about the book. I'm sure do you, a website, uh, Amazon, mm-hmm. where's the best place to, to learn more about the book and to follow you? So I'm very active on social. I'm at Megan, M-E-A-G-H-A-N-B Murphy on Instagram. And my website is meganbmurphy.com. Um, my book is available wherever books are sold. You can get it on Amazon. Um, I wish there were more brick and mortar bookstores, but sadly that's not the case right now. All the Barnes and Nobles in my neighborhood are gone. Wah, wah. We still have a couple left in Connecticut. And that was when, before we had kids, that was one of our favorite date nights was going to Barnes and Noble. And my wife would go into her section. I'd go into my section and we'd meet in the middle and like where the benches were, maybe over by like the magazines or if they had like a coffee, like usually it was like Starbucks, I think, and just hang out. Like it was just awesome. I love it. There's still um, a couple left here in Connecticut, but I don't know for how much ours, longer. You just love where ours are gone. Sad. So sad. sad. Megan, thank you for being a guest on the Project Purple Podcast. It's been awesome to have you on to share uh, your experience. And thank you for all you're doing to help people get through struggles, challenges, and as you said, uh, this pure evil of pancreatic cancer. Yay. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. If you liked today's episode, please share this episode and follow the Project Purple Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. That is a wrap of another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. Thanks for listening. And until next time, be safe.